Well, thank you for the introduction and to the uh, organizers for the uh, chance to speak here. So, um, yeah, so I will talk about free black lattices. So this is um, part of the same uh, joint work with uh, Timor, uh, Pedro, and Vladimir. Um, and Timor, of course, gave a, a very nice overview of the subject. And I actually want to go back to the beginning of the subject and um, give some, so a more, uh, just some elementary uh, intu intuition about uh, where the, the form of the freemonic lattice comes from, how they, like why it, the norm has certain uh, structure to it, why these uh, weak p summing norms come into play, and then uh, also give some, uh, well, some general principles that were um, guiding uh, our, um, our analysis of the subject and can also be uh, interpreted more broadly. So maybe uh, it'll be of some interest. All right, so yeah, so this is about free bonic lattices. It's joint with uh, Pedro, um, Vladimir, and Timur. And let's start at the very beginning. So what is a free bonic class? So the starting point is you start with E being abundant space. And the goal is to build um, a bonic lattice from this bonic space in some kind of universal way. So we will build a bonic lattice FBL of B is how it's denoted, together with some relation between E and FBLB, and that will be encoded by a map delta, which takes E uh, into FBL of B. And it's a linear isometry or isometric embedding. Okay. And we want to do this in such a way that, uh, you know, we preserve the structure of E in we we were building a lattice out of it but we don't want to have any extra relations other than the ones uh the metric uh, and linear structure of e and then the uh the necessary things to build a bonic lattice okay so how does that um that turn into uh, a picture so the picture is just this you start with e together with your map into the free space this map delta and i'll remind you that e is just a bonic space but now FBLV is a bonic lattice. And how do we encode that this is free? Well, we use the same kind of diagram as a free group or anything you use in, in algebra. So we have um, that for any choice here, X of a bonic lattice, and for any operator T, which will just be a bounded linear operator, that's all I can talk about because it's going from bonic space to a bonic lattice. Uh, I'll be able to extend it uniquely here. To a map t hat, and that map t hat is now going to be a better map, right? It's going to be a lattice homomorphism. We'll preserve the norm. So this is the um, the object we'll study. So the free bonic lattice over the bonic space, and um, as Timur mentioned, this has a rather concrete representation. So what I want to do first is well, convince you that such a space exists, but more importantly, show you exactly what it is, right? Because uh, free objects exist by rather abstract means. You can always, well, as long as you have, it's not too difficult to show such a space exists. What, what's, what's more interesting is that you have some concrete representation you can work with, and that's uh, critical for all our, 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 our results. So um, let's quickly um, get some intuition for where the um, this object comes from. So here's the construction of FBLV. And of course, it won't be an actual rigorous construction. I'm just going to give you some of the, the basic uh, building blocks of this. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some large enveloping space that we're going to build this inside, okay? So we're gonna start <laughs> with um, H of E, which is the set of all F 
from E star to R, which are positively homogeneous. Now, mind you, positively homogeneous means that F of lambda X is lambda F of X whenever lambda is a positive scale. Okay. So um, why do we start with this space? Well, there's a couple of reasons we start with this space. Um, uh, one is because you know uh, it's large enough that we can put all our everything we want to work inside, and it's not too large is that uh, you know uh, when we actually construct the space, we want to know as much information as possible. We want to know that there are actually functions on the dual ball, right? Because then you can say many more things knowing this. All right, so um, I'll give you some more intuition for why we start with this space in a moment, but let me just remark that. Um, we're going to build the free bonic lattice inside this space, so we need some norm. Okay, so um, inside this space, we're going to define a bonic lattice. So for F and H of E, we're going to define a expression that's rather complicated, but um, uh, is actually as simple as it could possibly be once you look at where it comes from. Uh, there's nothing simpler; it could be just from this diagram. This diagram tells you have to extend maps and it'll turn out to be determined by just maps into finite dimensional L1 spaces. Okay. So uh, the expression is this. We'll define the norm of F, the FBL norm, to be the soup over all possible expressions of sum i equals 1 to n of F. So F is a homogeneous function on the dual, so I can apply it to uh, xi stars where the x1 stars and xn stars lie in the dual space, and they have some uh, constraint, and the constraint is that their soup over the x and the ball of e of the sum of x by star applied to x is less than or equal to 1. So this is where the one summing norms come and when Timor was talking about this, but I want to show how they come um, in maybe uh, uh, some kind of just looking at maps into O1. So that's uh, um, what the first part will be. But uh, let me first just tell you what the space is and then I'll tell you uh, how this norm appears. So um, first off, to give you the free bonding lattice, I also have to specify this inclusion. And the inclusion is just the standard uh, duality map. Okay, so the inclusion um, delta is well for x and e. I define delta x from e star to r by just the standard evaluation. Okay, delta x uh, takes in x star and spits out uh, x star of x. With the standard embedding into the x to double dual. All right, so um, a very easy exercise is that uh, if you define H1 of E, and the one I will not tell you yet why I denote it like this, but it will um, become clear later, to be um, the set of all F in H of E, all these positively homogeneous functions with finite norm. This is a bonic lattice. Okay, so this is um, H this is a bonic lattice. Something that's easy to check. The, the operations are just pointwise operations, the best you could hope for. And well, the fact that is the final thing to this is just uh, you know it makes it an exercise to check completeness and all this stuff. Yeah. And the other part of the exercise is the map that sends x to delta x. Is an isometric embedding. Which you should interpret as when I restrict to E, this norm, like the, the deltas are my canonical copy of my bonic space E. When I restrict to that, I get the same norm as I started with. Okay, so uh, this is the the format, but this is not the free bonic lattice. The free bonic lattice is sitting inside of this, um, being the closed sub lattice uh, generated by the deltas, right? So the uh, free bonic lattice has to be generated by 
by E as a, as a bionic lattice, so that this map's unique, and that's what the, the free bionic lattice will be. Okay, so let me state that here. All right, so my claim, which I will try to convince you of, is that FPLV is nothing but, well, I take the deltas, uh, X runs through E, I take the sublattice generated by them, and I close <laughs> it up, uh, all of this taking part in uh, H1 of E. And uh, well, this theorem is, is, is not due to myself, it's due to Pedro, uh, uh, Jose Rodriguez, and Antonio Aviles. And my first question, of course, when I saw this expression was uh, why, right? So why um, is all of this, this action um, going to get you the free bonic lattice? And now I want to explain to you uh, very briefly, why um, this is very reasonable, um, although it is some work to prove. All right, so um, the first thing is um, all of our action is happening inside of this space of homogeneous functions. Okay, so why do we start with this? So uh, H of E, uh, well, the reason we work in this is it guarantees um, FBL of B is a um, space of actual functions, right? And by restriction, because everything's positive no genus, we can think of FBL of E as sitting inside of the continuous functions on the ball of each stuff, right? Because everything's positive no genus, it's determined by the action on the ball. And of course, you know, this is convenient to have that, F, like, you know, Many bionic space constructions are happening uh, as functions on the dual ball, right? This is one of the standard constructions. But why do we use homogeneous functions? And the reason you use homogeneous functions is because, well, lattice linear expressions are positively homogeneous. We're not just working with arbitrary continuous functions on the dual ball. We're working with uh, positively homogeneous functions because, of course, linear functions are positively homogeneous, but also lattice operations, right? If I take lambda x sup lambda y, this is the same thing as lambda and x sup y as long as lambda is a positive scalar. So this uh, homogeneity is what's uh, encoding the lattice operations. The next thing is, well, I'll skip the, the norm for a second and go to why do we close up in the deltas. And I told you already, well, by, if you want uniqueness of extension, you have to have the, the bionic space E generate the free bionic lattice. Um, um, well, that's something that has to be true. But um, there's another way to explain this. And actually, um, so the question is why they closed um, sub lattice generated by the deltas. Well, this is actually the free vector lattice. So this is the free uh, algebraic object over E. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if I take E and I put it in this um, generated by the deltas just algebraically via delta, this um, acts as a free object in the pure algebra sense. So if I take any here vector lattice and I have any map here that's linear, I can uniquely extend it to here as a lattice homomorphism, as a linear lattice homomorphism. Okay, so um, this is an exercise in function calculus. So I won't go through it here, but uh, we do a little half day argument, argument in, the, um, in the proof of this, but it's very natural, right? You should, uh, if you, you we will first extend your object algebra, your, your linear map algebraically to the free object, and then you want to go to the completion by continuity, 
right? So the norm, okay, this doesn't actually go up. <laughs> the norm is um, uh, guarantees uh, the map uh, T hat uh, on this free vector lattice is continuous. So if I want to do the diagram for the free bonic lattice, I take E here, I put into FBLV, which will be the completion of the free vector lattice under some norm. Which norm does it have to be? Well, the diagram says I have to be able to extend any map. So this norm must be pretty strong, right? Because, well, continuity, you need strong domain if you want continuity, right? So this, um, the norm that you place here has to be extremely strong. And you can easily convince her, well, there's two things it has to do. It has to be as strong as possible, but also agree with the, the deltas on the uh, generating set because you want this map here to be a, an isometric embedding, right? So uh, the, the uh, norm expression, uh, I'll try to convince you, is the maximal norm. Uh, one can put on the deltas. Uh, two property, well, just with, with such that, you know, it restricts to ease them. So obviously, that's to restrict the ease norm so that you get an isometric embedding. And then because I can pick this to be the completion of the free vector lattice and any other norm, this might, must be. Uh, continuous, so it must be the strongest. All right, so uh, that's um, where these algebraic objects come from, and now I want to explain where this um, actual expression comes from. Okay, so let me erase this. And my claim is that it comes from uh, my claim is that although this looks complicated at first, it's uh, as simple as it can be. And um, I'll try and make this rigorous by just looking at what needs to be true to be the free bonic lattice, and then it'll turn out that that's sufficient. All right, so, so what do I have to do? Um, I have to get some more notes. All right, so let's look at the simplest situation. So what I need is the ability to extend uh, any operator to the uh, free bonic lattice. And let's take the simplest situation of finite dimensional spaces at the L1. Okay. So uh, certainly, if whatever I claim is the free bonic lattice, uh, it will have to be able to extend maps into L1. Right? And OK, so let's do this. And at this point, the logic will be somehow backwards, because I'm going to assume a, a maximal norm exists, and then I will try and convince you it's the one we write. So we want to extend this to delta x, which we know we can the algebraic span, and then we want to equip it with the norm, which we'll call the free norm, such that the induced map on the free vector lattice is continuous. Okay. So this free norm is the maximal norm. All right. So let's go through this process of what uh, what, what appears when we try and extend such a map. Okay. All right, so we have this map T from E to L1N, and I can represent this map by just coordinate functions, right? So I can uh, find some elements of the dual space. So I can write T X is just X K star applied to X uh, for some X1 star to X N star in E star. It's a, it's pretty obvious. And now what do I want to do? I want to calculate the norm of this operator, right? So the norm of T is very simple. Um, it's just the soup over X in the ball of B of the sum from K equals one to N of X K star of X. Right? Because when you take an L1 norm, you just sum. Mm -hmm. All right, and the point here is that this map T hat, you can guess. Okay, you can guess what this map is, and the lift 
he had from the uh, free vector lattice um, through L1n is completely explicit. It's just this map. T hat takes an F and spits out F of X k steps. Okay. So you can easily verify this is a lattice homomorphism. And if I take T hat of delta X, what do I get? Well, I get delta X applied to X k star. Delta X applied to X k star is just X k star applied to X, which is my definition of T. So this is the unique extension. All right, so I've extended my operator to the free algebraic object, and now I need to extend it to the completion. So I need to know that the operator is bounded, right? I need to know I have a, a, a norm bound for this operator. So let's write down what we get when we do that. All right, so um, for we have to extend to the completion, we need, of course, extend to the completion with the same norm, right? Um, one of the defining properties. We need a bound of the form t hat f taken in L1 dimension n has to be less than or equal to the norm of t hat whatever norm I'm putting on the uh, free vector lattice. And by the defining property of the uh, free bonic lattice, the norm of T hat has to be the norm of T. So from this inequality, I learned that the norm of F free norm, as long as it exists, has to dominate the norm of T hat F in L1n divided by the norm of T. Now we can actually compute these things. So the norm t hat f in L1n is simply the sum of the, the coordinates and the norm of t we computed uh, somewhere here as the soup over the x in the box. Okay. Um, And you know the free bonnet class has to be able to extend such maps for any choice of t. So what do we learn? We learn that the norm of f three has to dominate the soup over all possible maps, right? So it has to dominate the soup of the expression here. So that's what we learned from this construction. And this is what I claimed was the uh, field. Okay, so that's why this expression, that you have some weak summing norm, you sum up all the, the elements, and then you have some strong summing norm. And this is why this appears. Okay. And of course, in this argument, I've actually proved nothing, right? Because I assumed I had a maximal norm. And I proved it's bigger than another norm. So this inequality means I proved nothing. But the theorem of again Pedro, uh, Jose Rodriguez, and, and Antonio is that this inequality here is actually an inequality. And heuristically, why do we believe this? Um, the reason we believe this is that the L1 norm is somehow the strongest norm there is, right? It's the closest you can get to the triangle inequality. And somehow, if you can extend maps into L1, which is the strongest, um, well, it's the free bonded space, if you will, um, you can extend maps into that space, and maybe you can extend them everywhere. Okay. So somehow L1 is sufficient to extend arbitrary maps. And that's what their theorem says. So any questions? So this is where the 
the norm appears. And then Timor was also talking about the, the P convex variant, right? Because somehow you see one sums here, and as someone in bonic spaces, it's your obligation to replace them with P's. <laughs> uh, and this is how the norm for the free P convex space appears. So let me quickly uh, find what this is. So a bonic lattice. is P convex, and I'll assume the constant is one, which you can always get by renorming if for any X1, Xn in well, the bonic lattice that I didn't name, <laughs> uh, the norm of the sums of the uh, P, uh, P expression is dominated by the P expression of the norm. And this expression is defined by function calculus, but we're working with homogeneous functions, so it's defined clockwise in our construction here. And so we can build a scale of spaces. So P between one and infinity, I just constructed the case P equals one, um, yeah, imposing some convexity condition. Okay. So what I will do is I start now with my bonic space. E, I again put it inside a bonic lattice. But now I require this bonic lattice to be P convex, so it's somehow a better space. And the price I have to pay is that I can no longer extend maps into every space, I can just extend them to P convex spaces. So instead of having any bonic lattice here, I just put a P convex spaces, P extends to P. Okay. So that would be the definition of the free. Uh, P convex bonic lattice. And somehow all the intuition I went through so far um, holds verbatim. If you just replace, try and extend operators into L1, you try and extend them into uh, LP spaces. Okay? And if you do this exact um, manipulations for um, LP spaces, you'll get the powers here and the peak power here. And you get the peak summing norms coming out. Okay. And so all this uh, intuition goes through the proof, the original proof that um, the free bonic lattice is how it is doesn't go through. So you have to actually work and show that little LPN is somehow representative of all P convex spaces in the sense that extensions into this space actually suffice to extend it into, into any P convex space. All right. So, um, these are where these expressions come from. And if you look at the case, uh, T is infinity. So when P is infinity, this reduces to soups, right? And this reduces to soups. And you notice that when, well, maybe I should erase. Uh, if we're interested in the case P equals infinity, the norm in the infinity case simply reduces to the standard soup norm on the dual ball. Okay. And what you can prove using Kakutani's um, representation theorem is everything that lies in the space. So we know that FPL infinity of E lies inside. H of E, well, now this was a one before I can put P's, it's uh, finite FBLP norm. Um, and this is the space of continuous positively homogeneous functions on the dual ball. And what you can actually prove is that every continuous positively homogeneous function on the dual ball is in this space. Okay, so what you can prove is that FBL infinity of E. Is just the continuous positive homogeneous functions on the dual. Uh, when P is finite, it becomes more mysterious because you don't know exactly what is in FBLP. There are certainly functions in FBLP that uh, you know are like eight functions in this space that don't lie in FBLP. So um, the case P equals infinity is very special. And actually, um, you want to go a bit farther, you can define a free 
unital AM space, so you would require a strong unit, or unital AM spaces up to representation are just C of K spaces, and the free unital AM space will just be the continuous functions on the group. You can also uh, get this explicitly. So um, these are kind of the extremes of the scale, and they actually behave very differently than the rest of the scale. So uh, my remark, just to not give you the wrong impression, is um, is uh, although um, FPL infinity of E, which is the continuous positive homogeneous functions, and the free unit of AM space, which is the continuous functions in a dual ball are very concrete. Uh, they aren't really representative. <coughs> of FBLP D or finite P. This is our uh, original hope is that we, uh, you know, when we introduced the P convex variant, we had already, there was already some results in FBL, which is P equals one. We figured out concretely what FBL infinity is. So we thought maybe we could interpolate properties. But as you saw from Timor's talk, the case P is finite and the case P is infinite are just very distinct. All right, and the way you can uh, maybe quantify how distinct these are is of course for separable, uh, Timor already mentioned this, you know, the continuous functions on the ball of B star agrees with the continuous functions on the ball of F star. And under some Slightly stronger condition, so ENF is monotone FDD, the FBI infinity space is a group. So, this is something Timor mentioned, but the contrast is that um, for one less than or equal to P less than infinity, Somehow the free space determines the original space up to some technicalities that we haven't yet figured out. With big, some big technicalities, but let's say uh, as long as uh, E star and F star are smooth and P is finite, FBL P of E equaling FBL P of uh, F implies E equals F, which of course the converse is always true. All right, so um, for the most part, we're, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about finite P because when P is infinity, we can't say much. Well, in the separable world, uh, maybe all these spaces are the same. Once you go to the non-separable world, there's many questions we don't know. Um, you can say, for example, E is a subspace of the WCG space, definitely at the CPH spaces. But then if you go to WCG or the things, things become very unclear with the topological properties of, of the, you know, uh, the space versus the, uh, the free infinity space, where it becomes a, a bit of a, yeah, well, something you don't understand. Okay, so I'm going to stick with um, P being finite and state this uh, kind of principle. I think I, I joke with Pedro is it's a meta theorem because it's a theorem we can never have any hope of proving, but somehow uh, this gives some hope that maybe you can do as many special cases of this. And I will tell you many special cases we were able to um, just to resolve. So the meta theorem. Um, is this given a bonic space property P? There should exist a property P prime 
such that uh, E has P if and only if the free space over E has P prime. So in some sense, this is what this is saying, right? If you could remove this, right? It would say that somehow studying E is the same thing as studying FBL. So you should be able to transfer properties back and forth. We don't know how to remove this. So erase it. Um, and, and of course, we can't prove anything like this. But I will now list several cases where we were able to transfer bonic space properties of E to bonic lattice properties of the free space. OK, so um, throughout the rest of the talk, it is finite. Um, because mm -hmm. if it's infinite, you can't say uh, anything. And I'm just going to state um, a theorem, some basic things at the beginning, and then we'll work our way up. Of uh, Somehow, given our bonic space property P that's uh, influenced by you know, my and my collaborators' uh, pace and whatnot, we'll try and find this P prime. Okay. But I think this is a this principle, um, you know, which properties P you choose is very much up to you, but this is the sum that we were able to figure out. Uh, Mitchell, sh shouldn't you get a whole scale of properties P prime as the little P varies as well? Yeah, but then I, I there are so many P's here that I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, in principle, right? That might be different um, yes. when you very little. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yes. Um, and this does come up, so. I mean, as expected, it comes up when piece two things change um, and and stuff like this. But yeah, I I think for the most part we can stick with p equals one. But you're absolutely right that uh, the property does depend on p. All right, so let's start off with something very basic. So maybe the most uh, basic property of a bonic space is its dimension. So p is finite dimensional. If and only if FBLP for any finite P has maximum convexity. And in this case, it has a, it's, it's, you know, well, it has a strong unit. It's a CFK space. So uh, in the finite dimensional case, you're just a renorming of a CFK space, but this will never happen um, otherwise. Uh, maybe something a little bit more surprising, um, but not too hard to believe, is E is separable uh, if and only if FBLP of E has a quasi interior point. So if you don't know a quasi interior point, you can think of it as a vector of full support. So it's an element E in X plus such that X, for any positive X, X in and E converges back to X. So it becomes somehow, uh, as you let n, let it grow, it'll eventually uh, surpass. Uh, uh, it's always true that if E is separable, then you have a quasi-interior point because uh, you can you know, sum up a dense set and whatnot. The other way is often false, but for free body processes, <laughs> they're the same. Um, the third property I want to say is that E contains Complemented um, L1 space uh, if and only if, well, um, FBL of E contains L1 with any combination of complemented and lattice. So if and only if FBL of E contains a complemented subspace isomorphic to L1, if and only if FBL of E contains a sublattice isomorphic to L1. If and only if it contains a lattice complemented, so like a, a complemented sublattice complemented by a lattice homomorphic for dimension. So all of these will all be uh, equivalent. Okay, uh, number four is we also have the local version. So somehow we can quantify when uh, FBL of E, or we can quantify when E has finite cotype in terms of some, again, a little L1 containment complementedly or. Um, as a sub lattice or whatnot. Okay. And I think the last um, property I want to mention in this direction is when FBL already has non trivial convexity in its own right. So Timar also mentioned this today. 
vai para o direct. So, um, number five is um, this is specific to p equals one for some reason. Uh, the identity on the dual space is p prime uh, one summing uh, if and only if f b l of e as an upper p estimate. Where an upper p estimate is exactly the same thing as p convexity, except you only require for disjoint elements. So you can characterize, this is another way of saying when FBL of E is uh, lattice isomorphic to FBL P of E for some non-trivial P. And the fact is that FBL of E for infinite dimensional E can be too convex, um, but for any P bigger than or equal to two, FBL P of E cannot be Q convex for any Q bigger than P. Okay. So FBL from P is one can be automatically two convex in certain cases, but once you pass two, you can never have any more convexity unless you're finite dimension. Okay. And from this, you can, from these kind of results, you can distinguish FBLP from the P convexification of FBL by using some properties here. And um, well, this is as much as I want to list um, this list, but um, uh, it can certainly um, be expanded a bit. So the next thing I want to do, um, this was somehow a correspondence between properties of E and properties of the free space. I want to go one step further and look at operators between spaces. Okay, so the, it's going to be somehow the same, the same type of question, but uh, one step up. Okay, so if I have two Banach spaces E and F connected by a linear operator, I can put this inside of FBL P e of E or whatever. I can put this in, let's say P. I can put this side inside of FBL P e of F. And then I can follow this map. And since this goes from a Banach space to a Banach lattice, I can get my induced map here. Right? So I can get this, I'll call it T bar which is really the hat of the composition of these two maps, okay? And somehow we now want to say, what is the relation between T and T bar? Okay. And what we've been doing before is somehow T is the identity, right? So if T is the identity, we're sent properties of E versus FBL, but now we can go one step further and look at relations between T and T bar. And we can say also several things about this. So property one is T is injective. Uh, if and only if T bar is injective, which coincidentally I was looking at archive yesterday and there's a paper on Lipschitz free spaces showing that this is generally false. Uh, the injectivity of the original map does not lift to injectivity of the induced map. And somehow this is something uh, that makes the flavor of free bonic lattices different. It's somehow more rigid than Lipschitz free spaces. And Lipschitz free spaces, you know, uh, the free space doesn't determine the original metric space, but we uh, all our evidence points to the opposite for free bonic lattices. So this is uh, one property. Another is T is surjective, if and only if T bar is. And I can also put dense range. Uh, T bar is dense range and start listing these properties. And you start to think that they all just will correspond, but then when you look at embeddings, this fails. So um, the most non-trivial uh, thing I want to say here is that T bar is an embedding, so it's bounded below. Uh, this certainly implies T is an embedding. but the equivalence I've written so far is not true. You also need some kind of LPN on the not extension theorem. On the not extension. So any map 
from the smaller space into uh, an LPN space extends to the, the bigger one with control of the norm. And that control will be exactly the, the, the norm bound here uh, in the isometric. Okay, so um, you can say um, certain properties about uh, operators. And one more thing you can say is about order continuity. So we had some thoughts about order continuity. If T is an embedding, this actually implies that T bar preserves infinite suits. And it's, so it's a, if T is an embedding, then the induced map is actually automatically order continuous. So a lot of time morphisms only required to uh, preserve finite lattice operations. It turns out that it will actually preserve infinite uh, lattice operations. So an arbitrary combination of lattice operations here will be preserved under this map. All right. All right. So this is the um, kind of the what we know about this meta theorem. So I think I can erase it now. Um, but I, I think probably um, it can be extended quite significantly. And the last quick thing I want to talk about is the application of free bonic lattices to um, arbitrary bonic lattices. Okay. So um, somehow, because free bonic lattices are universal, uh, proving something about them actually tells you something about every uh, bonic lattice in a sense. Okay. And um, one thing um, that we were looking at where um, you start with E having a basis. You place this basis through the map delta into the free space. And you can easily show that this is a basic sequence uh, because it's the same thing, but you can also show that if you take absolute value of it, it's still made as a basic sequence because, well, the, the induced the projections lift to lattice homomorphisms, they can meet with the lattice, and then these become uh, projections for your, for your um, basic sequence here. So you get a basic sequence. And somehow um, proving something about this particular sequence tells you about um, every possible sequence of this type in every possible bionic lattice. Okay. So let me give you a quick um, sketch of this. Let's start with a little LP space. Let's put it inside uh, the free bionic lattice over a little LP. Let's take the unit vector basis here and um, let's go upstairs and look at the absolute value of the unit vector basis. And well, from this diagram, if I take any map here into any bionic lattice, I can lift it. So somehow proving something about this sequence allows me to prove something more generally, right? And what I want to tell you um, is just about a very simple property about being weakly null, for example. So suppose we can prove that if you start with the little LP basis, and go to its moduli, you can prove that the moduli goes to zero weekly in FPL. What can you say in general? Well, what you can say in general is that um, if I take any embedding of little LP into any bonic lattice, this extension here will be week to week continuous, right? So then you can deduce from this, uh, deduction is the moduli, of uh, any isomorphic copy of uh, little LP in any chronic lattice will have weekly null moduli. Or will be the moduli of any isomorphic copy of little LP in any bionic lattice will be weekly null. And actually, you can characterize what basic sequence this is. When I start with an LP, I'll actually get an LR sequence. And uh, as long as R is not one, I'll get a weekly null sequence. Right? And so the theorem that we have here 
uh, is that um, for e bigger than two, little lp or c0 uh, has the moduli going to zero weakly in FPL of e, and hence you can use this uh, FPL of little lp, and hence you can use this deduction for the the moduli of any copy of little lp and any bonic lattice will always be weak to not. Okay. And the, the case p bigger than two is very important because everyone knows the Rademacher sequence. The Rademacher is built from plus or minus ones inside of any LP space. You take the moduli and get the constant one sequence, which is not weakly null. So p equals two is impossible. So Somehow, the way you can build Hilbert spaces in bonic lattices, you can use cancellation and randomness. But when p is bigger than two, you can never um, do this. Okay. So I think I will uh, conclude. Here. Thank you.